So this uses both coherence, which can be linked to this concern about cognitive, potential cognitive impairment and the issue of tangentiality. Can a person uh, stay on topic? And then the other dimension that we wanted to probe today is using the sentiment analysis capabilities of these machines to probe. But what are we seeing there? If negativity and persistent negativity is a potential indicator of cognitive impairments, mild cognitive impairments, what, what are we seeing? This is the AI Leadership Podcast by AI Leaders. Practical, to-the-point content, helping you drive results with AI. Here's Chris and Frank. Welcome to the AI Leadership Podcast. I'm Frank Strickland. I'm Chris Whitlock. Chris, in our last episode, we presented some analysis that we're going to now present a second portion of in this episode, analysis of coherence in political speech. We're going to extend that into another area of analysis in this episode. But before we get there, uh, we've gotten a number of interactions and feedbacks on the feedback on the previous episode. Uh, this particular uh Feedback from Jeff was indicative. Jeff writes, uh, great presentation as usual, gents. Really appreciated the careful walkthrough through the human cognitive processes that underline the analysis. Uh, people can share misinformation, either intentionally or unintentionally, very coherently and persuasively. Coherence is a completely separate and independent assessment from accuracy. Do I have that right? And, you know, we responded to Jeff. Yes, spot on. What we were doing that last episode was looking at coherence of political speech. Uh, this time we're going to look at uh, coherence and semantics. But Chris, it was really encouraging uh, the amount of interaction that we got on that last episode. It was, and some interesting ideas from people as well. But uh, that was great and glad it was helpful. Cool. So we have a rich body of content this time, folks. So we are going to pass over our segment, uh, what we've seen in the wild lately. We'll just point you to Ben Lorica's monthly roundup uh, on all things AI. We'll put that in the show notes. Uh, that is an excellent set of things that Ben and one of his friends are seeing in the wild. Uh, but we've got a lot of content for you in this episode. Uh, so let's get right at it. So since our last episode, uh, a little has changed in the environment. Uh, the president dropped out of the race uh, for starters, and there's been an increasing amount of writing uh, in the press by both media pundits as well as some experts in the area of speech pathology and neurology about indicators of decline uh, based on the speech of former President Trump. Uh, one of the things that's been cited is tangentiality uh, comes from the word tangential. All of you would recognize the the ability to stay on task, to stay on topic, uh, to have logical segues between topics so that people basically can follow you. And we have continued to use these Gen AI tools, these large language models to assess not only that, uh, which gets at the issue of coherence, how coherent is the speech. Uh, but this time we're also going to extend that uh, to looking at sentiment, which you can also use these tools for. So we're going to show you a body of analysis in this episode on both coherence as well as sentiment. Now, just as a reminder, the last time we referenced an article from the University of Edinburgh that we'll put into the show notes, it didn't have a graphic in it with this hierarchy of speech, cognition, and capability, uh, but we created this from the article, and it has at its foundation, building from the bottom up, the semantic knowledge base that all of us are building from the time we're children uh, through the rest of our lives. And on that semantic knowledge base is an ability for semantic selection. 
uh, to be able to reach into that knowledge base and pick relevant information to the topic uh, and prioritize that information. And then on top of that is a layer that allows for inference and pragmatics. So anticipating implied meanings, anticipating connections uh, as you're forming your speech, as you're forming uh, an argument, as you're forming a, a statement that you're trying to make. Uh, and then lastly, on the top, the executive functioning, uh, which is, as the name denotes, uh, the ability sort of to control all of this, to order your thoughts uh, and to stay on topic. And so we have been using these large language models to assess uh, this executive functioning or, in other words, assess the coherence, which is an indicator uh, of problems uh, in this stack, especially around the executive functioning. And so we did ask uh, a friend uh, who has an MS in speech pathology works as a speech pathologist. Uh, if this was was a fair summary, a fair rendering of her discipline, uh, and she said that it was, so that was encouraging to us. Um, in terms of scoring the coherence, we'll remind you that uh, we have used the models used, and we have referenced uh, this one to 10 level of scoring with one to two being incoherent uh, and nine to 10 being exceptionally coherent. And so there are levels within that three to four noticeable issues in coherence. Once you get to the five and six level, you're starting to be moderately coherent. So you can think of that as a break point. And then seven and eight is very coherent nine and 10 is exceptionally coherent. So that's what the model is scoring. That's the output on coherence that we're getting uh, in addition to, as we'll show you, uh, some explanation from the model as to where the issues in coherence lie or why it scored uh, a particular body of speech the way it scored it. So Chris, with that, let's dive into some of the content uh, from this uh, episode and super. the analysis. Yeah, super. Want to start at the highest level. So we're pulling two threads as we go through this today, just to illustrate how you can use tools like Chat GPT or Google Gemini to analyze content. Uh, on this particular view, uh, since the emphasis is now shifted uh, to former President Trump. I took the three Republican National Convention speeches, which he has delivered, acceptance speeches, 2016, 2020, and 2024. And I was simply curious, when you look at these speeches in the aggregate, uh, are we seeing any change over time? And that's a facet of what we want to do today is demonstrate how we can test over a period of time, how something may have changed. Uh, there are a couple of interesting items here, but keep the scoring that Frank shared in mind. These are prepared remarks. 2016 and 2020, uh, you, you have to score those uh, well. They uh, were within the normal range of expectation on the speech length uh, for these acceptance speeches from the political party conventions. Uh, coherence in 2016 was 7.8. I mean, that's almost at that score of eight threshold. It's, it's very coherent, very coherent. Um, in 2020, while the speech length increased slightly, uh, the coherence declined a little bit. Now, that's in and of itself maybe not remarkable. It declined to 7.2. That's still very strong, right? It's, it's strong with respect to coherence. Uh, what catches my eye here, it's not anything deterministic, but it's useful to take note of. In, in the 2024 speech that happened a month ago or so now, uh, the plan was for a 40-minute speech. It ended up coming in at over 90 minutes in duration. 
and the coherence dropped significantly. So if you look at 2016, it was almost an eight in coherence. Uh, 2024 dropped to six in coherence. So that's moderately coherent. But what would catch our eyes here is the change over time. Tangentiality implicates your ability to stay on topic, stay organized, and, and uh, keep your speech in alignment with the concept uh, at the outset. This would would be something that would signal hmm, uh, maybe other items worth looking at. Now, if you go to the next page, Frank, what we had um, discussed previously were setting some different benchmarks. It's really important in doing any kind of work like this in data science that uh, you have some baseline or benchmark references to compare against. And we'll give you several of those through the course of this material today. But one of them that we were interested in and suggested by a friend and former colleague was to look at the Obama-Romney debate from 2012. Uh, I completed that work since our last podcast and the results uh, are shown here. For those that do see the slide, it is um, similar to what we showed the last time. A blue cell is an answer from President Obama. A red cell is a pre an answer from uh, candidate Romney at the time, Senator Romney, and the number there is the coherent score from one to 10. Uh, to cut to the chase, two items, uh, Romney for every uh, topic that was explored was a little less coherent than, uh, than President uh, Obama, former President Obama. And in the aggregate or in the average, uh, President Obama had 8.4, that is very high in coherence. And uh, Senator Romney had a 7.5, which is also very strong with regard to uh, coherence. And that helps us have a reference point. A note of emphasis is these are ad-libbed or ad hoc responses. They're being asked questions. They know about the topic broadly at the outset, but they are responding in the moment and interacting in the moment. And uh, our takeaway when we look at this is fantastic, uh, excellent, very good, very strong coherence, uh, on topic, organized, evidence that these are the types of rationales that are given uh, by chat GPT to underline these scores. Uh, specifics are named, but it's not overly detailed. Uh, those are the types of things that the machine is looking for when it creates the score. Okay, Frank. Now, to move to this next chart, I want to summarize the last set of learning, uh, what we shared last time, uh, since we have completed some of these other items, but I will also want to set some anchor points that we will come back to. So in this chart, you are seeing the coherence scores. Uh, blue will always denote a Democrat or, and the person named in the horizontal axis there, uh, the red always a, a Republican. But as I just shared, uh, Obama 8.4, Romney 7.5, very strong coherence in their debate performance in 2012. President Biden, after the you know infamous, uh, I guess you could construe it that way, debate, uh, that something that became much discussed, he gave a press conference following the NATO convention in D.C. And in his prepared remarks, he had a nine of coherence. Now, that still requires the person to read well and deliver well, but his... Um, his remarks read against the teleprompter were a nine. Then he began to answer questions. And in his question answering, which is ad-libbed, it's impromptu, his coherence was 6.3 in the NATO um, press conference iteration. Now compare that to the Biden and Trump debate numbers. That's the last pair that you see there. 
uh, this I shared last time, it was a surprise for me because of what I had heard. I did not and still have not watched the, the debate. But the coherence of President Biden's responses was a 6.8. Now, that's close to that seven threshold. That's strong. That's very coherent. Um, by contrast, uh, former President Trump's remarks scored a 4.3 on coherence. And there were some common themes that tended to underpin those scores as I was reviewing how that played out. Uh, lack of structure, rapid shifts in topic and emphasis, lack of evidence, uh, not responsive to the question uh, being asked. A debate is that type of format. I'm asking you about the economy. You're talking about something that's not related or you're beaming all around on different topics. Now, we're not judging the goodness or quality of any of these responses from any of these candidates. What we're measuring with the tool is the coherence of them. And the message here is former President Trump's remarks were low coherence. In the scoring that Frank showed you, this would be notable, noticeable coherence issues are present uh, when they're looking at the responses. So that's a summary of where we went last time. Frank, I thought an interesting facet of this was the difference between prepared remarks and uh, ad hoc or impromptu answering of questions. And so we did a drill looking at inaugural speeches back to Carter. Uh, we had to show that. Yeah. So going back to President Carter and up through President Biden's inaugural, what you see here horizontally are all of the presidents that gave an inauguration speech uh, since Carter in 76, all the way up to Biden. And you see on the vertical axis uh, a plot on that coherent scale from one to ten. And so what you can see is that all of these are in the nine range. That would be the mode. There are a couple of them. And Chris, I think in all of these analyses and all of the speech products that we've scored, this may be the only time that we've seen a 10 score, and it was two uh, speeches, both of them given by President Reagan at his first inaugural and then second inaugural. Both of those were scored as a 10. Who was but, his speech writer? <laughs> Peggy Noonan. Um, yeah, it, it is interesting to me, Frank, when you look at that. These are really well-prepared remarks, and it is interesting to see the continuity over time in the very high performance, but those tens are standout. Yeah, I haven't, beyond these two, I have not seen tens in the scoring. Yeah. So you see just the overwhelming number here were nine. There were two, um, the second President Bush, George W. Bush uh, scored an eight. And President Trump, importantly, as you see here, scored an eight. Uh, indicative of prepared remarks where staff have spent a lot of time. Uh, trust me, I was in one of these staff jobs somewhat related in a senior staff job as a legislative director for one of the big intel agencies. And your director is going to give testimony to the Congress prepared remarks and you pour over those. And so you would expect when there are prepared remarks if the speaker stays with the prepared remarks, as all of these presidents did in their inaugural, you, you would expect those to score high. And this part of the analysis just demonstrates that. Now, as we said in the intro, we want to look this time in not at not only coherence, but we want to also use these tools to look at sentiment. And those of you that are in the data science community or data scientists, uh, you know very well and you've done work in using NLP for scoring sentiment. So the types of things, for those of you who don't have that background, the types of things you can score and characterize in sentiment using these tools are basic things like is, is the language positive, is it neutral, or is it negative? And again, those aren't good or bad scores. Those are just 
characteristics of the sentiment in the language. Um, you can get more granular scoring of that where you sort of get a scale of, is it very positive? Is it positive? Is it neutral? Is it negative? Is it very negative? Um, and then you can get characterization of the major themes. What are the big themes that are in the response or in the segment of some prepared remarks? So we want to use these tools uh, and we can use these tools uh, to very efficiently look at sentiment scoring and sentiment characterization. And so here is an example of that using those same inaugural speeches that we just talked about from President Carter uh, through President Biden. You have instead of the coherent score on the vertical axis, you have the sentiment score with the bottom being very negative to negative to neutral to positive to very positive. And again, prepared remarks for an inauguration, you would expect that the sentiment would be overwhelmingly positive to very positive, and that's the result that you see here. So all of these inauguration speeches uh, at a minimum had positive sentiment. That was the mode in this data set. Uh, there were three of them, uh, Carter's inauguration, President Reagan's first speech, and President Biden's inaugural speech that were scored as very positive. So using an example here, a straightforward example to kind of benchmark and see, okay, what are these tools telling us uh, about prepared remarks in a context like an inauguration speech where you would expect a very upbeat, very optimistic, very positive tone. So we're going to take those tools uh, and apply them to coherence as well as sentiment uh, on a wider body of data. Uh, but before we do that, let's take a short break. If this content is of use to you, we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and give this episode a like. If you're listening to this episode on Apple or Spotify, please take time to give us a five-star rating. And if you have a moment, leave us a quick review. You'll find more resources like this podcast and training courses at our site, aileaders.com. Let us know what you think. We value your feedback. Great. So picking this back up, we were very curious to create as many contrasts as we could. Uh, Frank, I think this is a useful one to do because it's fresh in people's minds. Uh, since Vice President Harris uh, declared her campaign, uh, there were two events conducted in Atlanta. Uh, she had a rally there uh, in downtown Atlanta, and several days later, uh, former President Trump followed and had an event there as well. This chart represents both the coherence and the sentiment scoring of those two speeches, now they were pretty remarkably different. Uh, the the Harris presentation uh, I would characterize as tight. It was twenty five minutes or so. The Trump interaction, somewhat like his last RNC acceptance speech, it was quite long. And if you look first at coherence you'll see that uh, Vice President Harris's speech scored a nine, uh, exceptionally coherent. Now, we don't know exactly the deal, but we would you know, expect these are prepared remarks. Uh, she delivered them really well, and it scores really highly with regard to coherence. With former President Trump, uh, 3.7, would be indicative of, you know, serious coherence issues at play. And if you look at the types of phraseology in the feedback, uh, not staying on topic, abrupt shifts in topic, logic is unclear, lack of detail, uh, too much detail, going from a policy issue to a highly personalized uh, kind of issue, 
those are present in the feedback. Now, I do want to make a quick note on technique. So in using these models to score or in using these models to tackle editing jobs, they cannot all take the same amount of input text. And so what we have done in every iteration is to follow a best practice of chunking or segmenting larger blocks of content at logical topical breaks. And so President Trump's 90 minutes of commentary, I actually had to break into several major chunks of content. And I did that at what I could detect were logical transition points in uh, what he was trying to address. Now, on the right-hand side of this graphic, you see the sentiment scoring. And in this instance, uh, I was requesting granular sentiment scoring. So very negative, negative, neutral, positive, very positive. Uh, Vice President Harris's remarks were scored as very positive. Uh, looking to the future, uh, intoning on certain themes that were important in uh, to that crowd, certainly, and important to what she is trying to communicate. In contrast, uh, former President Trump's remarks were negative, and overall they were negative to mixed. He would have interludes of positive uh, talk about the future and what his plan might be but in the feedback from the machine it's just constantly interlaced with quite negative and dire uh you know we're on the brink of world war three type uh things that that paint a very different type of picture so this uses both coherence which can be linked to this concern about cognitive potential cognitive impairment and the issue of tangentiality. Can a person uh, stay on topic? And then the other dimension that we wanted to probe today is using the sentiment analysis capabilities of these machines to probe. Well, what are we seeing there? If negativity and persistent negativity is a potential indicator of cognitive impairments, mild cognitive impairments, what, what are we seeing? And this graphic captures it. Uh, Harris, nine on coherence, very positive messaging. Trump, 3.7 on coherence, significant or serious issues in, in coherence, and negative in sentiment. If you hit the next chart, Frank, I think it will allow us to go a bit more here. So given Vice President Harris's performance in that analysis of her Atlanta remarks, a nine, and, and I will say it more uh, emphatically than Chris did, almost certain that she was speaking on prepared remarks and following the prepared remarks yeah. to speak yeah. for 25 minutes extemporaneously and score a nine, uh, highly improbable. <laughs> And so we wanted to ask ourselves, okay, how does she score then in a debate or, or in a Q&A environment uh, where she's not working on prepared remarks, similar to these earlier scores uh, of debates that we've shown you? And so we went back to the Harris-Pence debate uh, of 2020, and we took the question and answer pairs, the same thing that we did in the previous exercises that you've seen, and we had the machine score coherence uh, of both, uh, at that time, uh, Senator Harris's response and Vice President uh, Pence's response to a range of topics that you can see. And it's, it's interesting, and it should humble all of us as leaders and just as citizens. When you look at this range of topics on the left-hand side here, and it is everything from COVID to economic growth to climate change to China uh, to health care uh, to justice uh, and criminal justice reform. It, it is a tremendous range of topics. And you're getting those questions. You don't know what the questions are going to be a priori. And, and you are formulating uh, an extemporaneous response. And so what you see here 
is the coherent score for Vice President Harris in that context, a very different context, was 7.6. So still a, a very strong uh, coherence response, very coherent um, in, a, in an environment where she's getting questions and she's having to answer, so to speak, off the cuff. She's having to answer extemporaneously. Uh, Vice President Pence's score was substantially lower. It was 5.6, so it, it it still was moderately coherent, so it wasn't a bad score. It was right in that mid-range. Um, but what was interesting is there were four exchanges with Vice President Pence where he substantially lowered his score. His score would have been close to a seven, but in four of the questions and responses uh, threads, he doubled back to a topic that the moderator had moved on from. Uh, and again, if you just think what's being scored here is coherence, and this isn't sort of speech academics, um, this for a leader gets to the heart of the people that are listening to you as a leader. Can they follow you? Um, are they following your train of thought? Are they getting to the destination that you're trying to lead them to in your messaging? And doubling back on a topic that they had moved on from uh, creates problems with coherence, as you can intuit. Uh, and so the machine scored those anywhere from a 2 uh, up to a 4.3, uh, and that impacted Vice President Pence's score. But we saw uh, Vice President Harris uh, in Atlanta deliver a 9 on prepared remarks, almost certainly on prepared remarks, here she's in a much more unscripted, well, a totally unscripted environment, um, and she still scores very well uh, a 7.6. Chris? So want to quickly summarize these items so that you can compare them. And just moving from left to right in this data set, this graphic, the coherence scale, again, is shown on the left-hand side. Obama and Romney in 2012, both, both very strong, very strong. Biden in his uh, NATO press conference, very strong in delivering his prepared remarks and moderate, a 6.3 as it pertained to his impromptu uh, answers to questions. When we looked at inaugural speeches, Across the board, the average was a nine, irrespective of uh, political party or anything else. They were all very coherent. Now, you come to the Biden and Trump debate. Biden, uh, surprisingly to me, was a 6.8, responsive to the questions, organized, providing evidence, etc. cetera. Uh, former President Trump, 4.3. When you move to the subsequent Atlanta rallies, Harris, a nine in her delivery, uh, former President Trump, 3.7. And then uh, Frank just walked you through the Harris and Pence uh, debate results. What you're seeing there is uh, Harris, very strong in coherence, uh, Pence, I, you know, my own view, he's a capable communicator, but you can get tripped up in these situations. And as Frank allowed, it's a useful note for us all as leaders. He came in as a 5.6. Um, that's moderately coherent, uh, not showing any substantial issues, but he's not blowing the roof out with respect to coherence. Uh, next chart, Frank, let's walk through that. Now, want to pull the string here and look now longitudinally so over time i became curious as to whether uh former president trump might manifest any significant difference if we were able to look back at previous epics this is simply one fence post so to speak that we are planting in the ground this is a 2016 speech that he gave in detroit and it was on 
our future economics, his vision for our future economics just prior to the election uh, where he defeated Hillary Clinton. Now, an interesting element of this is the campaign issued the planned remarks. Uh, you get the speech as it's intended to be delivered, what is going to play on the teleprompter. And there are two dimensions that are being scored here in the vertical axis, coherence, and in the horizontal axis, granular sentiment. So very negative, negative, neutral or mixed, positive, and very positive. The uh, speech that he gave, the plan was quite good. It was an 87 in coherence, so it would be akin to these inaugural speeches in the coherence of the message. And with respect to its sentiment, it was predominantly positive while it did have negative components, chiefly about uh, the opponent, the political opponent or, or reflections of the current state. What was interesting to me is uh, you do get a little bit of a dip in the coherence of the delivery. So the planned remarks were expanded a little bit in the moment, uh, riffing, ad-libbing, et cetera. And so you could see coherence drop a bit, but that's still strong. 7.4 was the coherent rank, but or coherence rank, but the sentiment uh, was significantly more negative than what had been planned. Now that's fine. That's, you know, you're in the political moment. Politicians have to deal with positives, painting a picture of the future. They have to deal with uh, current issues and, and trying to construe those. But it's an interesting indicator with respect to former President Trump. I think more meaningful is uh, a look at more current press conferences and debate performance, and that's what we'll show you in this next view. For those who are able to follow and look at slides, what, what this one shows remaining consistent, coherence is in the vertical axis, and in the horizontal axis, granular uh, sentiment, very negative, negative, neutral to negative, neutral, neutral to positive, positive, and very positive. So a range of responses that the machine can give. What is scored on this chart are the prepared remarks, both from former President Trump and President Biden. President Biden for his NATO speech or uh, remarks and press conference. For Trump, it is the press conference that he held at Mar-a-Lago this past week, which is gotten a pretty good bit of attention in the press uh, and around some of these very issues that we are talking about. What we are doing here is quantifying that. So we are using the machine to quantify rather than just to apply our own intuition and subjectivity to the interpretation of it. The machine is quantifying and the results are pretty significantly different. So in Biden's press conference, and I can only imagine how that felt. I, I have reflected on this, Frank, with the pressure that he was under around his uh, capability questions, et cetera, at the time. His remarks were very positive in the scoring uh, overall, irrespective of the topic at play. Uh, his prepared remarks were very coherent, and then he had that average of, I think it was 6.8 in uh, overall coherence of his remarks, but uh, very positive. In contrast, the coherence for Trump's remarks at Mar-a-Lago was quite low again. It was uh, in the low fours that he came across with and the sentiment is low the the sentiment is chiefly negative some very negative and i think that 
is a thread that people can pull on when we look at this. Again, our question is in this instance to illustrate taking a business problem or an operational problem, are there indicators of cognitive decline over time? We've identified two areas, one tangentiality, which relates to coherence, and then the other is negativity, persistent negativity, and that connects to sentiment. And you can see it's a pretty remarkable difference here in the two data sets. And uh, we don't have a definitive point of view on this, but the tools used to quantify the results, we believe, are helpful in the dialogue. Uh, Frank, mm. back to you. So we have an analytical mindset. It's what we've been doing for well over 30 years, each of us. Our objective is, can we take data and models and apply them to an operational problem and gain some useful insights? And so we took data and uh, one of these large language models, ChatGPT 4.0, uh, and we applied it to our own homework. Uh, let's grade ourselves. And so we took the transcript from our last podcast, episode 22, where we presented the first part of this body of analysis around coherence and speech. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, you can see the scoring on the uh, uh, vertical axis, just like you've seen on previous pages. So uh, on the horizontal axis, on the vertical axis, I'm sorry. So you see the scoring from one to 10 on the vertical axis. And you see chunks of content, Chris referred earlier to chunking out thematic uh, blocks of content. Uh, and you can see the scoring here. And the net net is that the average scoring, the range was from six to eight, the average scoring is 6.9. Uh, as we said earlier, you get the score and you also get some qualitative feedback, which is very helpful from the model on why is the score what it is? Uh, and you get an opportunity to see some areas where you can improve. And so four things that were noted by the model, uh, there was some repetition uh, that the model said didn't necessarily have to be there. Uh, that's a judgment call, but it's useful feedback. Chris and I have taken note of that. Of times, creative repetition is key to communicating your message, uh, but you don't want to be overly repetitive and you, you don't want to be repetitive in a pedantic way. And so we've taken note of that. Uh, shorter sentences, uh, subject, verb, object, uh, as we all learned in English 111 is helpful for coherence. Uh, for all of you in the AI community, whether you're a data scientist or just an AI leader, uh, we had feedback from the model on being careful about the technical complexity. Um, when we are speaking to one another, then we can use technical jargon uh, because we're speaking the same language. But one of the keys for our role as an AI leader, for you as an AI leader, uh, is to speak to the people in the mission or the business uh, for whom you are responsible for serving, and they don't speak in that language. And so we got feedback on being careful about the technical complexity. And then sort of the inverse of that uh, is avoiding informal language. Um, we naturally use, humans naturally use uh, figurative language, metaphor, uh, et cetera. Um, and so those can be helpful uh, in terms of stylizing a message, making a point more impactful, more memorable. Um, but they can also, if, if you're not careful, uh, detract from the coherence if someone is trying to figure out mm, what did that metaphor even mean? And so and Frank, just to put a sharp edge on that, I mean, a portion of that informal language feedback was basically to me saying, hey, don't curse because you're frustrated with the inanity of their going back and forth of one another about golf scores, which I think is just colossally stupid. But that's a facet of what what and the machine gives that kind of granular feedback, which to me is great. All right. It's it's very helpful in understanding. And it's the same capability we've applied to all all of the content that we have showed today. 
Yeah, tremendous. Tremendous feedback. Uh, we greatly valued it uh, and are learning from it. Um, and whether you are new in your career as a leader or whether you've got a little uh, snow on your chin, um, as I do and Chris would if he grew some hair on his chin, um, it it's very valuable feedback regardless of where you are in your career. So average of 6.9, um, reasonably coherent. Uh, but some things that we took note of that we can improve upon, which we will try to do. So that wraps up for this body of analysis. So we've tried to fully articulate uh, anything that was on the visuals for those of you who are listening on Apple, Spotify, uh, other pod channels, uh, and so hopefully you were able to discern uh, anything that was on a visual. But if you want to see the slides, as some people gave us feedback on, you can go to our YouTube channel, uh, the AI Leadership channel, uh, and you can uh, see all the slides in YouTube. We'll put the articles that we've referenced uh, in the show notes. Let me say we are continuing to do analysis using these tools in this area. Uh, and so there are likely to be future episodes uh, just around this area of coherence uh, and sentiment uh, and demonstrating, illustrating the value of these tools. Uh, in one of those episodes, we will do a wrap of what we think are a handful of big leader lessons uh, abstracted from this analysis uh, that leaders can be thinking about uh, in their own communication. Uh, for resources uh, on how to increase your ability to lead AI programs, projects, people, and technology, uh, you can check out our website, a number of courses and useful resources there. It is AILeaders.com. That's AILeaders.com. Uh, but that is a wrap for this episode. So on behalf of Chris and I, appreciate you. Indeed. Indeed. Indeed.